Good morning, everybody. Fantastic to see all of you joining us today. Welcome to DVT's Inside Session. We have the absolute pleasure of Dale Williamson joining us today. Dale is the CTO for Databricks in EMEA. Databricks, as I'm sure many of you are aware, an absolute forefront player in the data space and in terms of what's going on in terms of the connectivity of data and data lakes along with BI and AI these days. And we are absolutely thrilled, Dale, to have you with us today. Databricks being here with a significant presence both on the African continent, Europe, Americas, in fact, global and worldwide. I think most folks that if they even touch Azure know that you are a principal player within the Azure space as well and are absolutely thrilled to know that we're going to get some insight today on how all these things tie up and come together. So again, Dale, on behalf of everyone that's joining us today, really welcome to you. We're really looking forward to this. If you folks that are have, or are joining us today are not aware of the usual format, we have a fantastic person like Dale present to us today. We will take questions from you. If you can use the Q&A function that's there at the top of your screens mostly, just raise your questions in that space. I will check those out, moderate those, and pose those back to Dale. Dale is joining us from London today. However, you will notice that he has a wonderful South African tinge accent to what he says. So he's completely understandable in terms of what he actually says. Dale is also very funny. He's entertained the German stock exchange yesterday. So today he should have a really easy time talking to a fantastic audience like us. Dale, welcome. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, it's 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 very good to meet everyone. It's very very good to almost be broadcasting back. <clears throat> my uh, my parents would be proud. <laughs> they live in Johannesburg. Um, my in laws live in Stillbay, so I'm I'm not sure how whether they could get signal. Um, it's kind of quiet down there. Um, but we brilliant. do have power uh, down here, Dale. So we're good. <laughs> You never know anymore. I, a funny story. I was actually presenting last year from Johannesburg and there was a load shedding in the middle of my presentation. So I actually went off and came back on. Um, but I'm super impressed with like how quickly that happens. Um, but it, it did kind of educate the, the, the European audiences, which was hilarious. It's the, resilience, cool. me... it's the resilience of South Africa, plus the fact that we just go, we need to take a 30 second break while we turn off the lights and turn them back on to make sure they're still working. <laughs> Love it. Cool. Let me let me jump into presentation mode. Um, so see that. That oh, is oh. up and running. That is up brilliant. And running. So I'm this is kind of a, a new talk that we've been doing because um, I've got a really cool job. Like my job means I get to kind of fly all over the place and I meet customers um, and almost try to understand their strategy and how we fit into it. So last year with the whole generative AI movement, um, we saw an unparalleled amount of confusion and, and you know, the T in my title sometimes stands for therapy where I was sitting in rooms trying to explain you know, what this stuff does. Um, and just for background, I'm actually a biochemist. I'm a Vitsi and a Nike. Um, I studied uh, proteomics down in the dungeons of one of the UCT labs um, for many, many years, looking at tuberculosis and antiretroviral therapy for HIV. Um, I also studied at Joburg Gen doing similar sort of stuff, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about what I do now. But if you think about AI and you think about then, it was very slow, but it was pre-cloud. It was a lot of, you know, using AI techniques and using Python code to wire things together. Um, so fast forward to today, <clears throat> I get to really enjoy like watching how things can move a lot faster. Now. This story about the missing middle, I'll get that to that in a second. Right, so um, Databricks quickly, you know, we are, uh, we're, we're, we're quite a big deal nowadays. Um, we're the data and AI company. Uh, our mission is to help solve some of the world's toughest problems with data and AI. 
Um, we're the inventors of Apache Spark, we're the inventors of De Delta Lake ML Flow. Actually, what's funny about this is there's a bunch of other uh, open source inventions that we've put that we haven't actually put on here. The guy who invented Apache Parquet is a Databricks employee. Um, the uh, MPT family of generative AI models that you can find on Hugging Face that are completely open sourced, including, including the training data and the weights, those are uh, through Databricks. Um, so, so, so we often have this big kind of seeding of um, open source in, in our kind of DNA. And, and that means we also foster the growth of these communities. We contribute back to these communities. Um, we also, you know, on the Gartner front, you know, two quadrants that we are leaders in, uh, and actually a, a new category that they're talking about called data-centric AI. Um, so that's basically, you know, more thinking about AI in the context of dynamic systems. And as we know, we don't live in a static world. So having the AI closer to the data, really a good thing. Um, we're well-funded. Um, we've got about 6,000 employees uh, and the global expansion has been quite remarkable. I had the pleasure of being in Johannesburg in an event last year. Um, so we've got about 60 uh, customers on the on the continent of Africa now, some big logos. So this is this is sort of the the, the traction's been quite remarkable. Okay, so let's cut to the chase. <clears throat> so this is a kind of story in the making. So as I said, like you know, proteomics guy, I actually worked for one of the the the, the startups down in Century City. Uh, there was an OEM to Cisco. So I was basically both a um, a practitioner doing full stack engineering and I was uh, sitting in a lab because it took you know 40 days to run any simulation um, because of scarcity of compute and storage so um, when I when I went corporate uh, which was in about, about over a decade ago I went into a kind of senior leadership role and I started to spot this really bizarre thing <clears throat> so it was one of the companies in Cape Town actually uh, where I started to see this the CFO of this they are a global organization, gave me a, 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 a board pack and, and this big block of, you know, PowerPoints that were created by Bain. And, you know, they were owned by a PE firm at the time. And they basically said, oh, you know, well, can you figure out what to do with this? Um, and it, it was about digitizing the business. And it was a really fascinating sort of puzzle. And I've sort of seen that all the way. And I'm seeing it even more and more you know, today with the AI hype. So that, that's the kind of context of the story, but it's also how do we apply this stuff? Um, and, and, and how do we answer the questions that are coming top down and bottom up? So that's what I'm trying to uh, sort of articulate today. And I've tried to make it a little bit funny along the way, because you know what, like no one wants to hear me drone on. Um, so as I said, travel around the world, um, these tend to be the kind of three things that often I get. I get the kind of top down, um, board level C-suite going, you know, how's this going to impact my business? Um, th there's the there's the sort of bottom up, which is a lot of the technology leaders and, and they're, they're kind of realizing how important data is to them. Um, generative AI, ChatGPT has all the public data of the internet. There's a whole lot of court cases kind of kicking off at the moment and a, and a whole lot of fun that they're going to have to go through to figure out copyrights and things like that. Um, but actually companies, enterprises, you know, that is the data that ChatGPT doesn't have. And, and, and that becomes super valuable. And, and then there's this middle piece, like how does your business change? And, and that is creating all sorts of immune responses uh, across the world and all sorts of experiments. So, so let's start briefly at the top and, and just go into kind of some of the, the, the things that we're sort of seeing. Right. So almost every organization has a Gen AI initiative. I kind of hear this from everyone. They're going, you know, we want to start experimenting. We want to start investing. We want to start doing this stuff. Why is this happening? Well, the top down is going, we need to do this, right? They don't want to be left behind. And then lastly, you know, this is actually kind of not all hype. Some of the stuff is actually quite useful. The problem is that it's very mature. And we're starting to see this really bizarre set of challenges as you put this into the consumer space. 
um, because these models tend to make stuff up. You heard about hallucinations. So this has been a huge area of research for, for Databricks is like enterprise AI, how do we how do we build guardrails? How do we give companies the tools to actually think about this in a fundamentally different way? But also, why do these things hallucinate? Why do these things make stuff up? You know, why does Air Canada have a court case going on where they now have to pay out for bereavement? Why did a you know recipe on a supermarket in New Zealand come up with a chlorine gas? Now, if you're a technologist and you kind of look underneath, you go, okay, well, maybe your product inventory should have been classified with food, not food. And simple like sort of thinking through of the tagging and the governance. Um, so the message to the board is quite a simple one, right? <clears throat> you know, you need to be able to control and own your models. You need to be able to have faster, more reliable deployment, and you need to be more cost effective. So I was with a, a shipping company recently, and they were thinking of their first POC going live, and they realized that the run rate would be a million dollars a year on POC one of generative AI. And it was a cool use case, but the, the analogy they used with me, which was kind of hilarious was, it's almost like we've got the ship and we've put one container with one product in the container. And that's how we're launching this thing. And it, we've tightly coupled it so much to this massive, massive large language model that the run costs are going to be really prohibitive. So how do we get to use case two? So this was basically the exam question they gave me. So what's cool is we are sort of seeing how enterprise AI requires this idea of a data intelligence platform. Now, placeholder, I'll get to what that is. Right, so let's jump to the bottom. So this is often, this is most of where my conversation kind of comes up. Like um, we are a practitioner's best bet so if you go to Databricks' summits in San Francisco, it's quite remarkable. About 10,000 people are practitioners or future entrepreneurs. Um, there's about 500 business executives. So we are very popular with <clears throat> Spark people, with MLflow people, with data scientists, with Python people, with Rust people, with... Um, with Scala people, they all come and gravitate to our platform because we remove a lot of the rough edges of kind of the DIY open source. And, and, and that's been pretty cool. And we also strive to think about price performance. So let's jump onto this kind of, and this is kind of funny because I've never done this in South Africa. So remember in history, we used to learn about the scramble for Africa. And, and how that was all about colonization and diamonds and you know all of that stuff. Well, the same thing's happening with data. And this was an Economist article when they realized that actually there's a huge amount of you know, movement and momentum and joint ventures being formed between companies with models and companies with data. Well, the, the reality is that that data is hugely valuable. So how are you utilizing that advantage, right? So you, every enterprise has amazing data. And this is how we should be sort of thinking about things. Like the data is the important thing. AI without data is just maths. And you should also be thinking about how you're protecting this, right? How you're consolidating this. And then start to think about data gravity. So I use this example, right? Um, if you are a retail store and you're selling data products in your business, what is the total addressable data products. How many people are coming to your store to shop for data products? Or do you have competing stores that are selling other data products, right? And often when I ask this of, of, of customers of ours who are like building platforms, like they'll go, oh yeah, you know, we got about 75% of the data. So I'm like, okay, how much of that structured? And they're like, uh, yeah, most of it. So I'm like, well, what about the other data? Are you consolidating that? Uh, what about the stuff that you're not even thinking of as data, which actually ironically has become a huge pattern in the AI movement called advanced data analysis. 
And, and, and why that's funny for me is because advanced data is also DNA. It's also protein, you know, sequences and things like that. But in the context of the enterprise, it's, it's definitely the business processes that are encoded in your SAP systems, the code and the metadata that you, that you manage. And let's face it, the Excel spreadsheets that basically run the business. So this is sort of how people should be starting to think about consolidation. They should also be start to be thinking about uh, the most important thing, which is protecting this uh, advantage. And the fact that they are actually should be looking at their amazing data as IP. And this has been probably arguably one of the biggest conversations I've had over the last year as people start to top down realize the value of the data they sit on and, and the inherent basic IP sensitivity that they have to be towards the data. So in South Africa, you have this poppy um, legislation. It's very similar to kind of privacy that we have in the UK and in Europe. And if you think about the exercise that you've done there, where you're tagging privacy sensitive data, well, why can't you use the same mechanics for IP sensitive tagging and other types of tagging? So this has been a huge area that we've been looking into as an investment. The other thing that we are looking into is that governance is changing. You know, we need to think about governance more than just structured text. We need to think about the regulatory issues, the ethical issues, the social environmental issues, the safety testing and auditing. There are really no proper tests uh, built out for how you test models. Like, how do these things actually work? It's almost like the brain. We don't actually know how the brain works. The brain, you know how to switch it on and off. And that's an anesthesiologist. Um, but we actually don't really know how it works. Um, and trust me, I studied a lot of the stuff at UCT and we had like a lot of theories, but no one really knows. Um, similarly, these models, you know, inside there are neural networks and they're really, really complicated. And there's a lot of um, research that's going on into figuring out how they work and figuring out, can we create a kind of MRI type thing for assessing you know the psychopathy of models um, so that we can test that they don't behave badly so this is an area that databricks is massively um, researching now what a lot of people don't understand is we have these really interesting sort of troves in the 6,000 people it's not just a big sales organization we are um, we have a huge research team uh, a lot of these people are research scientists that um, focus on ml build out, like how do you build models? What is a, a great way to kind of, what are the recipes you need? They're also focused on things like testing. They're also focused on things like, how do we, um, <clears throat> how do we prepare the data? How do we monitor and all of these things? Uh, and then the third area is thinking about like, how do we make governance a lot less driven by manual processes in an organization where it's kind of meetings and Excel spreadsheets and documents that have corporate policies and things like that. Like, how do we make that simpler? Uh, and if you work for a bank, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so we also have to start to consider like how metadata management is fundamentally different depending on the type of enterprise data silo that you're tapping into. And, and, and how do we harmonize that? And how do we start to think about, um, you know, the, the join up between what is knowledge management, content management, reporting management, data management, asset management, like how do we bring those worlds together and start to think about the harmonization of those things? Because the, 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 the sort of area of standardizing how you store, how you process data, we already do that. You know, we can convert pretty much any data type into Parquet. And more and more, we're learning how to govern over those and prepare the metadata in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way so that it standardizes and consolidates um, the data. And then it's actually in, a, in, in, in an interoperable open source format. So, so what's funny about Databricks being classified as a data base management system is we don't do storage. And that's kind of fascinating. So anyway, I'm going to leave you with that for a second. I'm also going to go into the one model risk exposure. So like that weekend of sort of about 
four or five months ago where the Sam Altman fired. You know, we had three seasons of succession on like a weekend. Anyone who wasn't staring at their phone was probably not working in AI. Um, and they sacked him and then everyone started to go, oh, well, hang on a second. What if we what if we put all our eggs in one basket? Now, what's funny is as a consequence of this, there's um, Claude three came out through Anthropic and broke all the rule, uh, all the records on uh, scientific measurement this week. Um, so it tells you actually, how do I swap the model out for a new model? Because there's a better one that's come along. You know, most of us sort of look at Google as the standard for search, but they weren't the first search engine. You know, so how do we create a way where we put models behind an endpoint where we know what's going in? To, pre to protect privacy and IP sensitivity, but we also uh, have a way of swapping out when a new and better model comes about and more efficient, more performant. We're also doing a lot of research. So a lot of the names on this list are Databricks employees, Databricks co-founders. And we are sort of seeing research in Berkeley around, because um, we're a very academic company. This is one of the things I love about working at Databricks is as an academic, you get to kind of really dig into things. We sort of see a shift from models to compound AI systems. And this is a public uh, uh, article, very fascinating to see what's going on in research. And it's not that different from monoliths to microservices. So there is this really interesting convergence starting to happen between what happened in applications and what's happening in data and AI, and actually how the two are coming together. And I'm actually gonna to touch on how talent is starting to spot this across the world. So just to sum up on, on that governance front, like Databricks is uniquely positioned because we have a platform that looks at all types of data. We're able to look at volumes, which are all the unstructured stores. We're able to look at tables and create a, a catalog of those. We're able to govern over models and we're able to uh, govern over features that you build for models. So it creates that kind of single pane of glass. And more and more, we're expanding those types of attributes and, 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 and sort of objects that we are able to govern over. Um, and we're also doing some fascinating things, which, um, which means using AI to enrich uh, the underlying metadata. And I'll get to that in a second. But let me also, let me just quickly jump to busting a bit of a myth. Most people think you have to use a black box model as a service. At Databricks, using our technology, you can train a 7 billion parameter model on your own data in nine days for 250,000 US dollars. Those costs are coming down. In fact, I think the last benchmark we did, that number's gone down to $200,000. Now, no company in the world will start with build their own model, unless you're Bloomberg. Um, so, who incidentally are, um, are, are, are building their second model. I'm just gonna leave it there. But you might start with an instruct model. You might start with a chat model. And these are benchmarks, you can find them online. We publish them regularly, we update them regularly. And I just couldn't find the latest update, so I didn't actually go and update it. But the numbers have gone down. Uh, but these are pretty good numbers if you kind of think about the ability to train a story writer um, in two and a half, uh, 2.2 days for $5,000. I mean, you know, this is a very low barrier, and this is on the training side. What we're starting to see is the numbers come down on the inference side too. So the run costs of running a model. And as you break it apart, where it's tightly coupled to this massive, massive model, you know, the shipping company example, you start to get the economies of scale. You start to figure out ways to build proper guardrails in place. So these are the sort of areas where Databricks and our technology is different. We're able to speed up development of building AI systems. We're able to help you to solve security implications. We're able to help you with model accuracy. So making it very domain specific. What's fascinating about training a model on your own data is you avoid something we call data contamination, which is, you know, it doesn't know about that weird thread on Twitter and then make something up based on that knowledge. You don't fall into these weird little neural network uh, features that know something about poetry and add that then to the answer or kind of make up a policy, meaning that, you know, suddenly you have to fork out a bunch of money for bereavement uh, refunds. Um, 
so so these are these are how we're starting to see the small specific models, lots of them that are trained on your own data are very accurate. We're also starting to see that the serving costs are coming down because the smaller the model, the lower the latency, the lower the cost. I mean, it's fairly obvious when you say it like that. So I'm just going to jump into some double clicking on these three points uh, because I think it's quite useful for you to sort of understand what I mean by this. So, so, so let's start with complete control. So why do you need complete control? Okay, by owning the model, you own the IP. By owning the model, you are able to know exactly how to explain the model. You won't be able to explain all of the model, but because you've used your own data to train the model and you are managing the end-to-end -end lineage of how data goes in and how data comes out, and you're able to look at the results, your effort to explain and your transparency index of the model is greater. And this is a really interesting area that we're sort of seeing it emerge in Europe specifically with the EU AI Act and this idea of model transparency and the fact that a lot of open source models are actually still quite opaque and the um, model as a service are incredibly opaque. No one knows what data was used to train them. No one knows what, um, what the weights are in a lot of cases. So, so, so this is a really fascinating sort of area and this gives you complete control. But this is tricky because you have to build a capability. Now, this is an opportunity for most companies to build their own labs, to build their own AI factories. Production quality, like there's a lot of learning here, but what's important here is customers care about the quality of the models and their outputs. Okay, what is the best truck? The Chevy dealership, like, you know, if it says, uh, a Ford, you don't want it naming the competitor, so it lacks context, okay? We at Databricks have this term called a Brickster. And if you go and look it up, like, you know, Brickster is a Lego Island game. So this context is missing semantics, okay? And then there's also things like Amazon.com. OpenAI changed their content filtering policies. And then boom, you have content filters and a whole lot of rubbish that ends, uh, ends up sort of coming through. So this is a really tricky thing that people are starting to realize as you really get into the details of productionizing these things. A, a sort of main area is production quality. Like how do you monitor this stuff? How do you actually look at the kind of life cycle management of these models? Because they are gonna change over time. And this is a really important aspect. Explainability is gonna be one of the key areas that we're gonna sort of see this year. And lastly, let's think about the costs. So this is a profiling exercise of the run costs of Databricks just using a Llama 2 model and comparing it to a number of other models on different, on different clouds and different solutions across the world. So this is a really interesting sort of benchmarking exercise. And more and more and more, what we're starting to see is this, this emergence of what we call model inference economics. So the run cost economics of a model. <clears throat> which let's face it is not the most surprising thing because that happened a lot when we were in, um, when we were starting to look a lot into, uh, into how cloud worked in the first place, the emergence of FinOps, and this now applies to model management. So imagine like we apply this to something. So, you know, I've got a bank in, um, in France that were telling me that the CIO was telling me that he spends 20% of his annual budget on maintaining code. So imagine we could apply this to a safe space internally and start to build something I call corporate archaeology, which is mined through the code, translated back to natural language. And you will probably find that you learn a lot about your business by asking questions of this code-based model. Now, in South Africa, you're probably going to have some that uh, are going to need to be translated back to natural language Afrikaans. Uh, my first job was at Suntime Insurance, and you know their entire system was built in Afrikaans. So, the what our, our the indicators is that you have to reverse engineer back to the natural language in which the original requirements were written in. And actually, in a lot of cases, you might have to think about whether an Afrikaans set of requirements were were written by an English programmer into their mainframe system. So there's a whole lot of fun that you could have building this AI factory, but you understand a lot about your business. So this is a really cool kind of 
area of research that we're doing a lot of work on. So let's get to the middle, right? And I'm conscious that I have taken a long time to get to the middle. So I'm going to go quite fast about this. Um, so I've observed this nonsense going on for a very long time. And this is the immune response that we're going to kind of see play out over the next sort of three to five years. And some companies are going extreme uh, and other companies are going are, are looking at this in a terms of how do I change the organization and how, how people work. Right. So I love this quote from Bill Ford. It talks about this person who had the name, he had the shares, he had the heritage, he had. He was Henry Ford's great-grandson, he was CEO of Ford, and yet when he asked for something top-down to be done, he hit this wall of clay in the organization, which was just literally this mental model that people had this ability to just continue working the way they always worked. So we build these incredible systems and the business keeps using Excel. Um, so think about like this as a huge, huge challenge, because actually we're in a world where the tooling, it's not the problem anymore. Uh, the processes, they can be changed. There's a mindset shift. So we are ha having to kind of challenge this illusion of control that people have over making businesses quite deterministic. And I, I, I think the volatility that people have seen over the last few years uh, has kind of made people realize that companies need to be a little bit more resilient and a little bit more um, adaptive. Now, I, I often tell a funny story about, you know, load shedding in South Africa with this, whereas like, you know, there was always a lot of congestion with traffic lights. And then when the lights all went out, actually the congestion fell away because humans are pretty good at self-management. And we actually all have to pass our driver's licenses so we all know the rules of the road. So, it was a weird observation I had last year in Johannesburg that there was less traffic. With it's a funny story. I watch a lot of weird. I'm stuck there. Let me go back. Okay. So the missing middle is not just one thing. Okay. And there is a problem and potential with the missing middle. So let's start with the obvious one, IT and business. Everybody, I stole this from a customer in Germany. This is literally what everyone goes through when IT is trying to talk to business. There is this friction that exists, this chasm, this you know misunderstanding. And, and I watched this as a customer. I've watched this as a consultant, and I've watched this as a vendor. It is truly alarming how technologists and business uh, leaders do not speak the same language. So this is a huge area that we think that data and AI can start to you know, fill the void. Another very interesting area that we're starting to see is basically like applied to the scarcity of talent. So this is a piece of research on economics of human skills and talent shortages. So the far left side, you have ML researchers, there's probably about 5,000 of them that uh, sort of live on this planet and that's their day job. If, the, if you kind of really look into the ML data science research engineer, you know, the people that are, are, are kind of building models, actually there's a far less of them than you really realize. There's probably about 50 to 100,000 on the planet. If you then move into the full stack side, you know, the full stack application engineers, there's, there's millions and they're all moving to sit and build and assemble applications, AI applications behind endpoints in much the same way as they did when people started to kind of realize what APIs could do for their, um, for their app dev. Another interesting area is this kind of middle of business that you're trying to kind of really connect with. So we often talk about use cases and this information layer and how it has to go through and then we come to the top and we look at this. There's this giant area in between. And this is the map that has to be really thought through. And, and we really have to understand how do we break this ball of clay? How do we assess it? How do we, how do we alter it? Like, what is it doing? And how could it work in a more productive and efficient way? This other fascinating piece of research that's come out recently is this missing management middle. So, so when, when things are stable and really happy, this you know, middle manager sort of sits in the middle and just passes information back and forth. But when things get really hairy, 
like let's say for example the generative ai chatbot goes live and everyone starts to go in a frenzy or a pandemic or you know inflation or anything else that's just kind of unforeseen all all pressure and overwhelming tends to happen so how do we change that you know in a fundamental way there's this really fascinating thing with communication so like if you you use the word project in a business context or in a data science context, you're almost speaking about totally different things, but you're using the same word. So can't we are, we're using this technique internally to, we've got 1500 people in our product and engineering team. That's a lot of alignment. They're actually using models as interfaces to talk to each other because it kind of translates into what they want to sort of understand. And we're, we're using research to build better models to basically make words a lot less of a problem. We're also using this in our platform to understand the business contextual language. So for example, inside Databricks, we use Databricks and we have this uh, notion of a DBU, Databricks unit, it's our unit of measure. And if you, if you look on Wikipedia, that could be an academic thing, that could be uh, a university, a language, a, a molecule. Um, but in Databricks, it knows that a DBU is a Databricks unit. It also knows that our fiscal runs from February to, um, to January. So it knows what a quarter is for Databricks. It also knows what, uh, what Europe means is we've got Northern, Southern and Central, and you have to remove Israel, Middle East and Africa from Southern in order to get a, a sort of proper view of Europe. So we can put that in as a prompt. And what it generates is a SQL statement that has all the correct where clauses to remove Israel, Middle East and Africa and to land us in the right quarter and to look at the revenue. So it's a really fascinating sort of way in which we've used generative AI in our platform. Um, <clears throat> productivity and, and, and this whole idea of kind of efficiency. So we talk about generative AI impacting productivity. What we sh really should be talking about is how do we make processes faster and humans more effective? That's actually what we should be talking about because humans are probably doing really you know, shitty jobs and they're not getting to actually do their best work. And a lot of that kind of routine stuff could be looked at in a fundamentally different way. My favorite one, and this is gonna be the punchline of the whole story, is you see a lot of people wiring up these incredible platforms and building all the consolidation bottom up, and then they put them into these dashboards and send them to their business users, only for the business users to go, how do I export this into Excel? And that is what I call the last mile problem. The second is the why problem. If I look at a dashboard, I have information. I don't know why the data has changed. So we even have this internally where like, you know, I'll have five emails hit my inbox to go, why has this pipeline moved to H2? And, and, and answering why is an important thing. And then scaling knowledge and intelligence, like actually figuring out how we layer those things in to the interface for analytics. So building your AI portfolio should be starting with the what the hell moments that you have in your organization. Anything in business as usual that's taking a really long time that makes no sense, like procurement, are great targets for starting to do efficiency and effectiveness gains. Procurement directors are amazing at negotiating. They spend a lot of time going through contracts. Can we do the second half faster so they can spend more time negotiating? Like, there are very interesting questions we can kind of ask. So, so sort of we see these as safe spaces. So instead of pushing these things out to the wild and you know having to deal with the consequences of a chatbot making things up, push them internally, push them to the edges between you and your, um, so the ecosystem, you know, your suppliers, your, uh, the, the, the sort of spaces between your business and other businesses, or the spaces between your business departments. Focus on knowledge. Knowledge is honestly one of the biggest use cases that we sort of see playing out at the moment. This idea of getting an answer rather than a, a, a list of blue um, sort of things that you have to trawl through and figure out. Productivity, massive gain. And I'm gonna give you an example. And then governance is an area we're investing in to try and make that simpler, more efficient, more frictionless. So going back to like my biochemistry base, 
sepsis is a huge problem in hospitals, okay? And antibiotics, the last class of antibiotics was um, 60 years ago, right? So 60 years. And this is a group at MIT who took empirical evidence, trained it into a very specific model and found a new class of antibiotics for the first time in 60 years. And this process took them about seven weeks. This is the power of productivity improvement. And this is the power of what these models can do. They don't remove the researchers. They just take a huge amount of the research burden away from the researchers. And we've trained a model on the entire corpus of PubMed, the publication medical journals. So it makes people that used to do what I did at UCT, makes your job 10X, 100X, 1000X more easy. I need to actually figure out what the X number is there. Um, <clears throat> if, we, if we look at compliance, you know, taking this back into an enterprise context, you know, there's five questions that every business sort of ask about compliance, and that costs them 10% of revenue because this is a very process heavy, um, very manual inspection and, and, and analysis and consulting kind of uh, area. What if we were to build an application that fitted in the middle, that connected a whole lot of really interesting things? So remember the code model I mentioned earlier? Imagine that code model could ask you how you have applied compliance. Imagine you do the documentation through knowledge management. Imagine you've got a third party that's giving you the outside in perspective of what compliance you have to adhere to. And imagine having a gap analysis tool that you can actually use to figure out where we, where, what should we be doing? Like these are massive areas where we can create huge business efficiency. So how does the right platform support the business transformation? So let me just quickly talk about Databricks. So like as a lake house, which is our concept, we have this piece in the middle. The bottom piece is an open source access layer that is unparalleled and it gives you ability, like we actually can see like this graph of how data flows in and how it can flow out and how it can flow to another company that has the same setup because it's an interoperable open source layer. So we literally have graphs, which I can't unfortunately show you, I'm hoping to get to show you, of like the entire value chain mesh from, a, from, from raw materials all the way through to the Boeing engine, all the way through to how they source the weather data and how that links in to you know, sustainability and removing carbon emissions from their air, aircrafts. And then that governance layer is the Unity catalog piece that sits above that. So it gives you that single pane of glass to look down into your operational governance. And it doesn't do everything governance expects to do, but it plays a good role as a, as a sort of team player with a Calibra or with, with a sort of purview or one of those kind of top-down um, application governance tools. But what we are really doing is challenging how people do governance and how we apply AI to governance. So with how we're operating today, we know generative AI has already changed the data platform. And if we take the lake house and we add the generative um, capabilities, we get this data intelligence platform. So what that means is this changes everything. This is models trained on your data, understanding the prompts that you're giving top down. So it starts to learn how your business works, starts to learn your business language, starts to learn your terminology, starts to learn exactly how to answer. And then thumbs up, thumbs down if you get it wrong. So it gets reinforced through every person using. And you start with the practitioners and you expand out. So it actually changes the frontier of low code and no code. So very, very simple set of principles on like how we expect things to sort of evolve. And then remember this. OK, so really fascinating. We actually don't know what the future interface is going to look like. We have no idea. Like there's this famous quote where um, Steve Jobs uh, and Bill Gates were interviewed when mobile hit. And Bill Gates was very opinionated and said he thought that it was going to be this peripheral to the to the laptop. Uh, where Steve Jobs went, I have no idea. And it's going to be fun to figure it out over the next five years. And he even said in his statement, I wouldn't have thought you could take a GPS and plug it into the phone, but I've just seen somebody do that as an app when they jailbroke the, the app store. 
And that's turned into an incredible business for them. So we're starting to see the same thing play out. So we had a, an Israeli uh, fintech company and they did this really fascinating thing. They had the CEO that would fire off a bunch of emails after looking at a bunch of dashboards. So what they did was they started to profile his active usage and they looked at of the tables in his, in his catalog, they could see from dashboard usage, monthly active usage, that there were only about 30 out of 2,000. And then they, they took all the emails and they built a prompt library by cleaning out the emails and just having the one-liner email sort of prompts that he had. And they fired that into training a model on top of the data that they had basically built uh, English SDKs on top of. So they created effectively an NLP cube on the 30 most used tables and used emails as the uh, past emails as the prompts. And they put this back in front of, uh, of the CEO and he argued with this for about a good 30 minutes and got around 90% of the answers that typically was looking for and answering the question why. So this is what we call Project Genie. And this is an experiment that we have been doing building these ide this idea of an NLP data room that sits behind an endpoint that whatever the future interface is going to be, we can serve it with natural language translated, contextually relevant and accurate information based on the underlying data that it has, which is a super cool sort of new um, emergence. But what it means is I was asking a, 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 an executive in a round table the other day, how would do you want your information to come to you? And he said to me, eight minute podcast of my data. That would be me happy walking to the tube. And I thought, huh, interface is changing. So these are my takeaways that you need to think about the broader picture of consolidating all your data and putting governance in place. There's a lot of education. There's also a lot of experimentation with the what the hell moments so that happen as business as usual. And with that, and slightly over, um, I will uh, end that talk and Carl and I can have a little chat. Brilliant, Dale. Brilliant. I, I'm sitting here going, goodness, there are a couple of things in there that I'm going, wow that's fantastic and let's go do that and then there are a couple of things that you you kind of touch on and i go that is terrifying and i'm wondering why we invited you here in the first place <laughs> well the thing about south africans and the thing about the african continent is we're hardy and resilient and actually we get it faster than most you so there's a white paper we were writing with one of our customers in South Africa. And it is really going to give most of our American banks FOMO um, because of just how advanced some of the things are that we're doing. It's fascinating. So I'm I'm I almost expect that everyone on this call will go, huh, okay, we're in. We're up for the challenge. Absolutely. And and I'm I, I do I Prior to us starting the session, just for everyone's information background here, I said to Dale, the, the danger of the Q&A session at the end is that it sparks a bunch of questions on my side and I'll keep everybody <laughs> here for the whole day. But I will invite everyone that's attending again. If you do have any questions, please do drop those into the Q&A section and I will try to be kind and pick out some of those and intermingle those with all my questions I plan on peppering Dale with. It, Dale, sorry, just to, to jump in straight away, I, I kind of would like to hear from you in respect to the following a, a few years ago and, and maybe not that many but we had the whole big data trend which kind of mm -hmm. came in and, and every business was suddenly you have to do big data you absolutely it's going to revolutionize what you do it's going to change everything it's going to get you down to one-to-one -one marketing it is the answer to everything and if you read the superficial content that comes out these days in AI, th there are a lot of parallels, obviously, in terms of you must do gen AI, you must do these things. It's going to change everything. H how do you see this implementation of technology being different to what came out in that previous big data series? So <clears throat> AI 
it, it, there's there's a really fascinating way to look at whether these things are real or whether these things are ready for prime time. Um, so crypto had exactly the same thing. Metaverse had exactly the same thing, right? If you go into the research and 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 actually look at the the contributions to ac uh, academic research over decades, AI has been following this really really cool sort of growth line okay and it's it's time look it might be that we don't get a we, we don't get to that kind of freaky breakthrough that everybody wants but the breakthrough that ChatGPT did and showed the world and the fact that that's just been repeated by many others and repeated by the open source community tells us that these are immensely useful tools, okay? And that they should be applied. They might not, you know, they might go into another winter. We might hit a kind of bump in the road where scaling laws happen. But in their current form, they're immensely useful. Um, and, but I, I, I say that with, with care because they're also immensely chaotic. Um, so you saw the examples I gave, and they're just two of many, many examples. Um, but if you're working in a safe space with this, and 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 you start to see massive business efficient inefficiency, like things that could be done a lot better, things that could be done a lot more efficiently. You know, we've never really done knowledge management well. We've never really, you know, there's a lot of aging workforces where the knowledge they can't kind of replace. Like I have this. Uh, a lot in the energy sector where, where they're like, you, we've got all these people that are sort of 45 plus that will be retiring in the next sort of decade. And there's no catchment to replace because nobody wants to do this. They, they all want to go do something over there. How do you kind of institutionalize that domain knowledge? And, and, and how do you kind of, th these are really simple ways. And they're probably the biggest areas that we're sort of seeing uptick and and usefulness um it is going to require the planet to get like a crash course in critical thinking um because you can't trust everything that comes out but the fact that it creates such ridiculous efficiencies is 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 sort of worth it right um and look you know Critical thinking is not the worst skill to actually develop. In fact, it's one of the reasons I kind of picked the schools that my daughters go to, is that they've really pushed on critical thinking. Um, so it kind of takes us back to first principles a little bit. Um, I do think that there is a bit of a hype train. I hope that what my talk did was kind of give you a lot of, this is actually some stuff's real, but some stuff's not, and you, you really yeah. need to think about guardrails. Um, and, and, and that's where why we've been investing the way we've been investing is the guardrails, the picks and shovels, the build your own models, because we want everyone to be able to do this stuff. Because the more that are able to, that it's that kind of open source community contributor thing. The more that contribute, the more learn, the more understand. And, and it's like, you know, you, you can't stop it being used for bad things, but the more people understand, the more people can spot the bad things. Like if right. it's in a walled garden and locked down, you know, you just end up with paying $250 for insulin that costs $4 to make. You know, the, 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 we've already played that book in the pharmaceutical industry where licensing and lockdown and only a few companies able to do it, it's not good for humanity. Yeah. And and you've hit on the word that I was I was going to come back to trust and and the analogy with that is well not analogy but the synonym with that being confidence in the models and mm. and what you get out of them and being able to go it will consistently reliably and accurately provide an answer to a, a given context scenario question that might be posed and and I guess that's perhaps one of the things to ask an expert like you is 
in a, a situation where an organization does take that model of complete control, like you said, and you know the data that goes in it, that there's still the variability of the neural net model that ingests that and determines its weights on the factors that are there and comes mm -hmm. up with some sort of representation of it as to how it sees the pattern of data. How, how do you advise organizations to actually get to a level of confidence that matches the risk depending on the data that they fed in there? So if you if you consider two two answers to this question. <clears throat> so one, we've always been super deterministic in the models that we put into businesses. Like we are risk models, like they are really deterministic. They 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 kind of have to the, the confidence indicator has to be so high. Um, and, and, and we've always applied that, but the world is not deterministic. It is unstable. It's a complex system. So th there's kind of duality that has to exist in solving every problem. It is part deterministic, part probabilistic. The probabilistic has always been filled by humans that carry bias. You know, so, so, so often, like if you think about somebody waking up and having a bad night's sleep and then going in and giving an analyst report, are they giving a, a kind of hallucinated version of that report? Um, are they giving a really good, complete picture? And are the people that are listening to it hearing the complete picture? So we kind of live with this all the time. Um, if you think about like Uber, Uber has a deterministic path that it solves, which is point A to point B. It also has a probabilistic aspect that it tries to figure out, which is, oh, there's congestion, let's go that way. Um, so it's a really simple example of showing how a problem can be solved with both sides, um, but humans in the loop to offset the risk of these things going haywire is still gonna be fundamental for a long time. So this is just a, a better tool at answering the probabilistic side in probably a slightly more objective way. Um, now, the really interesting area that it's going to take us into is how do we account for bias? How do we account for data contamination? How do we account for data poisoning? Like if you think of a DDoS attack, and but, but then you apply it to somebody kind of really pushing data in to weight it in a different way. Like that's a cool area for us to start to actually think about and, and build security policies and build a whole lot of new guardrails around. Um, so. I don't think that this is, I think this just moves us from thinking that everything can fit into a into a square KPI um, where the, the, the data that's coming in is actually a hexagon. It's just never going to really work. Yeah. Um, and we're still really rubbish at predicting the weather. I wonder why that is. We're really rubbish at predicting economic situations. I wonder why that is. Like probabilistic sides of things um, might help us to be better by balancing the two, but it's not a it's not an or thing. Well, economists and and weather forecasters, right? They they tell you exactly what the weather might not be, and then they explain <laughs> why they didn't get it right. Exactly. Looking back, it's all good. <laughs> in 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 respect to what we had previously around data governance, there was the the concept of of data stewards, which again were were people within the organization that then owned a domain of knowledge and the validation of that and the protection of that within an organization. In in terms of what you're looking at with governance, security and and privacy control, legislative requirement, et cetera, with, within the AIBI platform situation with Databricks. Do, do you see roles like that coming through in the future of, of AI stewards? We're not killing the stewards. So basically, like that, that, that role still is required, but we've really given them rubbish tools. Like stewards have the worst job ever because they also probably have a day job. Uh, and if you think about their day job and then you think about, you know, I now have to also think about owning this particular block of data or this domain. I have to think about the quality. I have to think about measuring it. I have to like the tools that we have given those people are awful. Can we give them better tools to do that role more effectively and then also concentrate on their day job? Because I have yet to see an organization that has only a steward's role is only to be the steward. They are always multi-hatted. 
Uh, and, and if we make that more effective by making the job to be done more efficient, the steward becomes way more relevant and there's a lot less resistance to becoming a steward because that's the other thing. Like the amount of times of sort of, you own the state and no, no, I don't want to touch that. I'm not in charge of that, please. And and now for organizations that are, are looking at at going on this journey and and to be fair, the AI journey, a lot of people think of it as new, but it's not. It's been there for a long time. It's just Six, gaining 60, 70 now. years. Yeah, because the, the barrier to entry has been killed by by NLP and the ability to talk to the machine and, and ask it for what you want. And then <laughs> without critical thinking, just accept the answer and act on it. Right. Buy ice cream when it's cold. Good idea. But in terms of the projects that that folks are undertaking and the ability to adopt a platform like Databricks, which facilitates that and probably accelerates your experimentation with it and the ability to build models and do things, what, what does an appropriate team construct now look like in undertaking mm. those projects? So we're seeing a lot more cross-functional teams. So like, I'll give you an example. Um, imagine you're an insurance company, right? And you have a commercial real estate portfolio. And some new legislation comes in that says um, the risk profile for using a particular type of concrete is, you know, elevated. So you know that immediately means you can up the premiums for buildings that have that particular profile. Okay. But the job to be done of trawling through 72,000 building surveys to figure out which of the 2,000 buildings you can apply this to. Today, that's done by a bunch of actuaries and a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of other, you know, very experienced humans who, it, I mean, it's just soul destroying to think that that's what their job is, uh, to just trawl through these documents. These models can trawl through and find weak signals and, 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 and almost detect. And the more accurate the model, the more you've got that kind of reassurance. So, so these are sort of areas that you can kind of, what are the what the hell moments? Like that's a what the hell moment, like six months to just figure out which of the, that it's five buildings, right? And, and this is a true use case that I'm actually like talking about, like we legitimately have done this, but because they have the right governance of the model, they can kind of see the accuracy indicators. They can start to build in guardrails. They can start to really focus on how do I make sure that the model can be trusted? And what is my tolerance for this not being trusted? Like, am I happy with 60% accuracy because it still saves me six months? I like, guess it all it all winds up then tracing back to the the cost of being right or wrong and whether that that makes business sense in terms of doing it. Well, the cool thing about owning the model and having a lineage graph of the underlying data. So imagine like the documents are your data and you can go, okay, here is the building survey for building A that actually has this type of concrete, trace it back to this document. So I can go check, right? So, so it doesn't remove the, the, um, the human inspection. It doesn't remove the curation. It just removes the, you know, reading every document line by line. Uh, the, within this, they, there comes that aspect that that you kind of hit on earlier as well. It, it's almost the complete non-technical aspect of what makes success happen in this space. So the change management with people, mm. shattering that illusion of control and going, actually, no, you, you defer this whole part of the engagement through to the model and the model needs to be trained etc and validated and then yeah. eventually you work with that model and and i kind of look towards that and go all right how do you guide people now in terms of how do they prepare for this how do they actually oh. talk to their organization and go capability there hype yes but practical mm. use yes but for you now as the people within our organization, our team, our, our community, how do you prep those people for what's coming, what is, and, and what they should be looking towards doing with it? So I talked a lot about education, right? Um, people using tools is a very good way to kind of learn how they work. Um, 
so how we've been doing it inside Databricks is we run experiments in really, you know, areas that basically these models can be applied that create huge amounts of efficiency, but also we can sort of see what's going on. So like the dog food thing, right? Um, so customer mean time to resolve, right? We've been able to draw that down by 25% just by thinking through like how you use this model with the people looking at the customer support and how do we inspect it? How do we increase the accuracy? What does the model build recipe look like? So that's almost like an internal application lab that we have built to help us with our own understanding, but also to help us with our own efficiency. We're 6,000 people, we have 12,000 customers. We're, we're like, um, we're, we're growing fast, but we also don't want to overbloat the human capital that we have in the company. We want people to be doing their best work. If you think about every organization having their own sort of lab construct, it doesn't have to be like, a, you know, the hardened research lab with the scarce people that we have. You don't need a lot of people. You actually need a small proportion. So going back to your staffing construct, you know, you've got a couple of really dedicated people doing some really interesting sort of gnarly work, and they're they're kind of mining through. They don't, they're like some of them could actually just be grads straight out of university, but you complement them with line of business executives and line of business leaders and and the stewards. <laughs> Let's face it, they're actually helping the stewards to do a better job. So that's a good place to start, right? Um, so there's a lot of areas where these internal labs could be applied. I gave you the code thing. So we have a company, one of the biggest banks in Sweden, that has created an internal AI lab, and they're learning the craft of model building and model assembly applied to their legacy systems. They're learning it applied to you know, compliance processes. So all of the examples that I give, they're not kind of hypotheticals. There are tangible um, lab constructs that are being set up. Part of that lab construct is experimentation. Part of that lab construct is education. So like every CIO should almost have a PR team. Um, that's, that's sort of helping to build credentials around this and, and, and build like a, like a, there's always, I mean, we had this with Salesforce when it came in as a SaaS business. We we're suddenly offloading sales management to this application. You know, why did we trust that so easily? Uh, but yet this is a little bit more freaky because this is a little bit more freaky. But, you know, I, I can promise you, like, the more you do this, the more you kind of dig into it, the less scary it becomes. I use perplexity AI all the time on my phone. Uh, I have the pro version. I think it's amazing. Like, I use ChatGPT. I compare the two, right? Um, using this stuff makes it less scary. Yeah. And, and Dale, I, I've become conscious of the fact that we're already 10 minutes over the hour and I would go another right. hour over the hour if, if we were allowed to. I just want to, to give you an opportunity just to, to wrap up and, and maybe just mention to folks, there is the, the recently published research bit that was put out by Databricks and MIT in terms of some of the stuff there related to generative AI and how it's, how it's being applied and where it can be applied. And, and perhaps you just want to comment on that and go, look, for anybody that is now stepping away from this and going, OK, Databricks is a great enabler in this space. My organization may or may not have started on its journey. What would be the, the three points that you say, hey, focus here, steps one, two, three, and then on from there? So step one, get your data house in order, right? Like you have a lot of data. Do you know where it is? Do you know like what, what's going on there? That kind of gravity thing that I was showing in the beginning, that's like a super important little exercise to do. Um, and, 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 and then start to figure out what the plan is. Like what's the plan to really understand and dig into the stuff? The second thing I would be looking at is education. Like just get like people using these tools in a safe way internally. Like it is really tricky to use them in a safe way. Like the policies you have to put in place about not putting like your strategy document into ChatGPT to ask its opinion. You know, that those are like kind of basic hygiene factors. 
but there's there's ways to kind of use this stuff internally and we have a lot of literature and a lot of learning we publish a lot of content on how this stuff works there's a lot of videos on youtube um, learning and enablement material um, the mit piece kind of comes in it more from a from a business adoption thing and then the third is thinking through like how would I start to experiment? Like, how do I start to build this kind of lab construct internally? You know, it's just not that dissimilar from like a center of excellence or a center of enablement that you probably would have built for you know, 100 other different technologies that you put into your business over the last few years. Like you probably put one in for Blue Prism. You probably put one in for um, for a whole bunch of automation stuff and a whole bunch of, uh, um, you know, other cloud things. This is just a new kind of aspect to that. Um, and companies that are doing that, that are creating this, this sort of capability internally and, and starting on like the boring stuff, <laughs> um, they're the ones that, and the boring stuff is actually quite fascinating when you actually unpick it. Like uh, the amount of people that were like, when you said code, you know, it's more boring to manually migrate like a Teradata platform onto Databricks, it's way more fun if you have a lab that's playing around with cool stuff while you're doing that. Because, you know, people, the happiness factor, there's literally a book written about migrations and happiness and, you know, the, the correlation between those two things, um, or unhappiness. I think that there's plenty of places to kind of work. Um, but those are the three takeaways. Those are the really key things. Data house in order, figure out how you're going to educate people and figure out how you start to experiment. Fantastic. Dale Williamson, CTO at Databricks in EMEA. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's been absolutely fascinating to hear from you and gain your insights today. Thank you, Dale. Really appreciate you. Amazing. Time. And thank you very much for, for welcoming me. It's been, it's been great. I, I, I get quite emotional thinking about home. <laughs> Always welcome to return, Dale. We have a spot for you here, as always. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. And thank you to our audience for joining us. We will be holding more sessions, obviously, in the future, Tuesdays and Thursdays, DBT Insight sessions. We look forward to meeting with you again. Thank you and have a great day.